went to China at the end of World War II, just 23 years old, looking for adventure in a faraway land. She found it, and she was witness to the events that changed the world. She served her country, and she knew the men and women whose lives and decisions affected millions. She learned the language, and learned to live among the people who told her their stories. She saw what was coming, and she was determined to tell everyone about it. Two years later, just 25 years old, on her way home to tell her story, her plane was lost in the mountains of western China. This is the story of Barbara Stevens, a beautiful and fearless young American woman who traveled alone into one of the wildest and most remote places on earth in the midst of civil war, revolution, and espionage, and who never made it out alive. Barbara Stevens was born Barbara Ellen Bierbauer in Westchester County, New York, the middle child of three daughters. After high school in New York and in Washington, D.C., she attended the University of Alabama for two years. She then transferred to Barnard College in New York City. During her time at Barnard, her parents divorced, and she took her mother's maiden name, Stevens, as did her sisters. She graduated from Barnard in 1944. The world she entered after graduation was a world at war. America and the Allies were advancing toward victory, and American patriotism was at its peak. By 1945, two of her college friends were already serving overseas at army posts in Italy and France. It would not have taken much persuasion to convince a bold and high-spirited young lady like Barbara that an opportunity to serve her country in an exotic foreign land halfway around the world from New York might be a grand and wonderful adventure indeed. And when the chance came in the spring of 1945, she took it. It took just under one month for Barbara to reach China, and by the time she got there, the college girl was a seasoned world traveler. She left New York from LaGuardia Field on Tuesday, July 10, 1945. After a fuel stop in Newfoundland, the plane flew overnight across the Atlantic, made another stop on the Portuguese island of Santa Maria in the Azores, and landed in Casablanca, Morocco on July 12th. Barbara spent two days in Casablanca before a flight across North Africa, with stops in Oran, Tunis, Tripoli, and Benghazi, landed her in Cairo, Egypt on the 15th. After three days amid the pyramids and Sphinx and along the Nile, it was off to India. Her first stop was Karachi, today the capital of Pakistan. She was there a week and had her expensive camera stolen by thieves. Then it was a train trip to Agra, home of the Taj Mahal, and on to Calcutta. It would be another full week in Calcutta before she could catch a night flight over the mountains to China. Landing first at Kunming, the plane finally reached Chongqing, the wartime capital of China, on August 2nd. The United States Office of War Information was established in June 1942. Army General Albert Wiedemeyer was in charge of its operations in Chongqing. Barbara Stevens arrived in China on August 2, 1945, landing at the Chongqing airport after flying over the hump of the Himalaya mountain range from India. She began work in the OWI office the next day. Just one week later, the Japanese surrendered, and it was VJ Day, the end of World War II. The OWI office swiftly became a combination command post, social club, and gossip center for the young servicemen and women who, all of the sudden, found themselves in China with no more war to fight. Monday was VJ Day, a big day for Chongqing. Everyone assembled at the circle in the middle of town and started screaming, hollering, and generally acting Chinese. This continued throughout the day, winding through the streets. The parade was mostly trucks with red, white, and blue bunting, flags of every nation but the Japanese, and enormous color posters of the four big shots. Every truck was overflowing with humanity, and those who couldn't get inside hung in clusters on the rear, on the sides, on top, even on the engine. The bright paper dragons, the masks and costumes, and the loud color and confusion resembled nothing in the world. It was a little like Mardi Gras, but <laughs> there 
there actually just aren't any people like the Chinese. I was the rear flank of the parade, riding in a jeep with five army officers in the back seat on top of each other. In addition, we carried 10 to 20 Chinese boys who hung on the jeep where they could, and where they couldn't, just hung on to someone who did have a grip. We were cheered for hours, thumbs up and ding hao, and in order to avoid creating an international incident, we were required to reply with as much enthusiasm as we could muster. But the kids are cute. You can't help laughing at them and shouting back at them. For about four or five hours, riding around town behind the parade, we were surrounded by a sea of dirty, grinning faces. I wouldn't have missed it for anything, but I'd rather die than go through it again. August 14, 1945. We caught a ferry across the Yangtze, 45 minutes to cross an extremely perilous stretch of river. The water was high, and a ferry's sort of a large raft. You drive down into the mud to the very edge of the river and through two or three feet of water and then try to get lined up on two little runways. The chief occupation in China, I have found, is watching and verbally assisting. For every 10 people who do a job normally requiring two, there are always at least 10 more who watch and encourage and criticize or do all three. The countryside is all farms and very hilly with terracing up and down both sides. Along the way, there are innumerable rice paddies, and there was usually a coolie plowing up to his knees in water with a water buffalo doing the dirty work. They move so slowly, and the coolies prod them very gently and whistle strange tunes to them. No matter where you drive out in the country, the roads are lined with Chinese walking in both directions, loaded down with water buckets, buckets of food and belongings. We saw one man with the yoke over both shoulders with a basket on each side carrying a little baby in each basket. I don't know where or why they move, but they always seem to be moving somewhere. At General Olmsted, we sat on the front porch under the ceiling fan and watched the surging river below, which was carrying with it houses, furniture, runaway sampans. Every hour or so, you could see someone float by, trying to hang on to a log, but being carried swiftly out to the river by the current. A crowd along the bank shouted loudly at such times and made feeble attempts to help them, but there was little hope, and most of them finally sank from sight into the muddy, swirling water. Chongqing was the provisional capital of China during the war. In the months that followed, it became a hotbed of international activity. The U.S. Army Office of War Information was transitioning to the U.S. State Department Information Service, and representatives of every political faction in China and of every foreign embassy visited Barbara Stevens' office. Barbara attracted a lot of attention, and she was familiar with men such as General Albert Wiedemeyer, commander of the U.S. forces in China, Soviet Air Force hero Alexander Nivakov, communist leaders Chao Enlai and Kung Peng, and American writers John Hershey, Christopher Rand, and Graham Peck. Though it was the capital of China and home to the Generalissimo Shang Kai-shek and Madame Shang, Chongqing was considered a frontier outpost by most Americans and many cultured Chinese who preferred the more cosmopolitan city of Shanghai. Monday, I had a date for lunch with Anna Lee Jacoby, a famous woman war correspondent who knows more about China than most anyone here. I'd met her the week before at the press hostel. I didn't know much about her except she was the only woman correspondent allowed into Chongqing during the war. She invited me down to meet lots of people who are dying to meet me as she's told them all about me. God knows what all. A glamorous description, no doubt. We went to General Olmsted's place for lunch. I always find it interesting to listen to what the people who are supposed to be running things here have to say about the situation. Everyone thinks and talks of nothing but Chinese politics, especially now when things are so tense and undetermined. I suppose by now you've seen Jack Wilt's picture of Palmer Hoyt and me in life. Jack is terribly proud of the pictures, and he spent hours promising me fame and fortune in the movies if I would only accept it. I met him one night with Palmer Hoyt at the press hostel, and he immediately insisted that he wanted to do a life goes to a party story with us. Life goes on a date in Chongqing. That Saturday, we went over on the south bank of the Yangtze River and up into the mountains. 
at the top of one was a Chinese temple, so we rode up in sedan chairs, which was a terrifying experience, as in places the path was all jutting rocks and only 8 to 12 inches wide. The view from the top was beautiful, miles of jagged mountains and the river. Sunday, we chased around all over town, riding in a sampan, shopping, visiting the enormous city gates, pagoda-like architecture, five or six gates, 100 feet apart. The ancient stone road between them is the Marco Polo Road, six feet wide. It goes to all the major cities in China. That night, we went to a Chinese restaurant for dinner and afterwards to Chinese opera. Palmer's working for United Press and expects to leave for Hanoi, Indochina, to look into the incipient revolution and the political situation there. Thursday night, the Generalissimo gave a reception out at one of his many houses in Shantung, a little village in the mountains surrounding Chongqing. He keeps his private army in the mountains, and you can see them at any time of the day marching around through the mountains. There was quite a crowd there, all the brass in Chongqing. His front man, a big, fat Chinese colonel, hollered for everyone to make a path through the center of the hall. As the Generalissimo and Madame Chang reached the door, I was standing right there, and they began to walk down the aisle. He was grinning from ear to ear, his eyes bright as a little rat's. And in a dead silence, the only sound was the squeaking of his boots and the quick, how, 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 a greeting said, as fast as possible. Flash bulbs flashed from every direction, and then we all shook their hands and grinned. Madame Chang and he each made a speech. The food wasn't bad, though. I don't think they have yet been able to comprehend the appetites of Americans. After 10 minutes, the tables looked like a bunch of locusts had descended. Chongqing was the center of Chinese political activity, much of it cordial and polite on the surface, regardless of what went on behind closed doors. Central government leaders and communist leaders mixed socially, despite their differences. Being a bright, attractive young American woman, Barbara Stevens was approached by actors and agents from every corner as each wanted to curry favor with America. One was the communist general Xiao Enlai, who ultimately became premier of the People's Republic of China. It was Xiao who officially welcomed President Nixon on his historic visit to China in 1971. And Barbara became good friends with Madame Kung Peng and her husband Xiao Kunhua, publicity agents for Xiao Enlai and the communist delegation in Chongqing. In the years to follow, Madame Peng and her husband would remain close to Chao and hold leadership roles in his Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In the following story, Barbara recounts how this friendship led to a most unusual set of circumstances. December 13, 1945. I just got back from a week in Shanghai. I left a week ago, loaded down with letters and packages for all the friends of Chinese friends here not to mention a husky and active Chinese baby belonging to Kung Peng, who is Zhou Enlai's secretary. She and her husband are both writers for the only real communist paper in China. Since they've been in danger of arrest, they were anxious to get the baby down to grandparents in Shanghai. They live at communist headquarters, known as Number 50, a narrow alley lined with shops and open restaurants and almost in the street. Chinese Gestapo were all around disguised as tangerine sellers, as well as communist agents. At the end of the alley is a building with number 50 painted on the door, and you pass through two anterooms till you come to a door with a boarded-up window with a peak hole. You ask for who you want, and after a lot of scuffling and murmuring, you're allowed to enter. On the wall are large maps of China with black arrows all over them and secret written in each corner. At last, Kung Peng came in. She's young and attractive with large, intense black eyes. Her husband is tall and lanky, has the same intensity and eagerness. We sat down and drank tea while she gave me last-minute instructions about taking care of the baby. Arriving at the airfield, we created the expected stir, a blonde girl with a Chinese baby being an unusual sight. The plane looked more like a bus with seats that are narrow canvas benches from one end to the other. The center was piled high with suitcases, trunks, a jeep, and 10-foot bundles of stuff tied up with string. I sat down with the baby on my lap. 
And until this time, the baby hadn't let out a squawk. I was holding my breath. Suddenly, he screwed up his face and began to wail. I envisioned a five-hour plane trip with a wailing foreign baby to whom I couldn't converse. So I resorted to the thing that had amused him before, an Afrikaans lullaby, something like this. Simbamba, mama's little baby. Simbamba, mama's little child. Ring his neck, hit him on the head. Throw him in the ditch, and he'll be dead. <laughs> he got a tremendous kick out of it and shut up immediately, but the lady next to me heartily disapproved. My first impression of Shanghai was dragging into the lobby of this very fancy hotel with a bedraggled infant and a great pile of luggage and seeing the place absolutely swarming with impeccably uniformed officers, fur-coated white rushing girls in tow. Afraid that the baby would cry again, I had to take precautions, singing some more of my outrageous lullabies as I couldn't think of any more appropriate ones. In my room, I went to work getting the little rat shined up so his grandmother wouldn't disown him when I dumped him on her. I bundled him up again and headed for a taxi cab to take him home. It's about 11.30 p.m., and after winding around for hours through narrow lanes, we finally arrived at the proper address. Dragging the baby with me, I got out, started beating on the door, there not being a light around. After about Ten minutes, a light appeared about three stories up, and I ended up shouting, I've got the baby, and the window slammed. All sorts of noises issued from the house, and finally, someone opened a door. I stuttered in Chinese that I had brought the baby, trying to ignore the cab driver who kept pointing to his watch and hollering something about a curfew. I stepped inside, and a whole bunch of people swarmed around me, expressing tremendous gratitude which embarrassed me greatly since I couldn't explain how much fun it had been bringing the baby. He's a wonderful kid. And to my great pleasure and amazement, he hollered like mad when he saw I was leaving. I went back a couple of days later to see them, and the baby shouted gleefully when he saw me and wouldn't let me put him down while I was there. December 24th, 1945. Christmas party started on Saturday. At our compound, we decided to invite everyone in Chongqing. We sent invitations to every embassy in town, to all the communists, all the Kuomintang officials, all the American embassy people, and all the officers and enlisted men in the Army and Navy. And the party was a tremendous success. The head of the Ministry of Information came, along with General Zhou Enlai, who was the leading communist in China next to Mao Zedong. My friends, Kong Peng and her husband, came with General Zhou, and there were central government officials to offset the communists. All the Russians came, and all the people from the other embassies. There were a dozen Chinese generals, two American generals, and all the correspondents representing their other countries. The climax of the evening for me was dancing with General Zhou Enlai, who kept patting me on the back and congratulating me for taking Kung Bang's baby to Shanghai. Climax of the evening in general was Minister Casey Wu shouting at General Cho and the chief writer for the communist newspaper, you damn communists always get me drunk, and then laughed loudly and put his arms around them. They had all gone to Wampoa Military Academy together, and so are old friends and new enemies. Barbara left the USIS office in Chongqing shortly after the New Year, 1946 and used her vacation pay to move north to Peking. Several of her friends were there already and told her it was the most beautiful city in China with the best climate. She bought a bicycle and found a place to live near the forbidden city while she looked for a job. In Peking, Barbara and her close friends Graham Peck and Lao Ye were among the small group of Western journalists, writers, poets, and native Chinese companions known as the China hands. They were young and adventurous, and they shared a love of China, her people, and her culture that marked them as different from most Americans and Europeans in China. They were also outspoken in their criticism of the Chinese national government, and viewed the insurgent communist movement with optimism, hoping its popularity in the rural provinces would bring about a form of representational government balanced between both sides. They also feared that America would intervene militarily to support the national government, 
and possibly touch off another world war. That didn't happen, but these expatriates were all but forgotten back home in the controversy over who lost China. Peking, February 21st, 1946. Last week, I was working for both AP and the French press agency. I had a wire from AP Shanghai congratulating me on excellent filing. They don't know I've never worked for a newspaper before. They'd die if they did. And also, the French press was pleased and offered me a job as regular correspondent for $75 weekly, which is excellent pay. They cover the Far East, Europe, South America, and America. For the first time today, I saw my stories in print in the Shanghai paper on front pages after only being a newspaper woman for a week. It's hard to know what people at home think about China. The negotiations here went pretty well. Everyone is confident that the ceasefire will be successful, as both sides are anxious to end the shooting. The people whom I trust think that as long as the Generalissimo remains in power, there will continue to be a dictatorship. This problem will never be solved until the peasants and farmers who make up most of China get a decent break, some say so in government affairs, and freedom from the exploitation of warlords. There are many civilian Japs and Germans in Peiping, and little effort is being made to get them out. It is thought by many people, including State Department people here, that if the Kuomintang remains in power, there can be no doubt of a Chinese-Jap alliance to forestall a communist China and the Russians. Most of the Chinese newspapers have become quite anti-Russian because of their fear of the communists. I I'm not pro-Russia, but if it means ganging up with the fascist bunch, I'll stay in the middle or lean the other way, as they are trying to promote war here. I don't think the Russians have designs on Mongolia or Manchuria, except they don't want the Americans and the Kuomintang ganging up with the Japs in the Far East. The roster of journalists and writers barred from China is growing and contains the foremost experts on China, who are not nearly as pro-communist as they are anti-Kuomintang. Nearly every correspondent can write little real criticism because of censorship, and I'm quite sure that I am on Tai Li's, the Chinese Gestapo head, blacklist just for carrying Gong Tang's baby to Shanghai. It's all very strange, confusing, and interesting, and will probably come to no good. In a note dated February 11th, 1946, Barbara's mother, Mrs. Stevens, warned, Barbie, again, let me emphasize that it is important for you to be most careful in what you say and do and where you go, especially since you're no longer connected with the government. You know that I'm not an old fuddy-duddy, and I know that you will be wise. But feeling is intense over this Chinese political situation, and you have no official status whatsoever. To date, Barbara Stevens' story has been told only in fragments, impressions, memories. The American writer Graham Peck had invited Barbara to Peking, introduced her to the China hands, and claimed to be in love with her. However, in his lengthy China memoir, Two Kinds of Time, he makes no mention of her at all. The book China Hands by Peter Rand, son of Barbara's close friend the China Hand Christopher Rand, is the best available source of stories and anecdotes about Barbara from those who knew her in Peking. He describes her as the adventurous, golden-haired beauty who set out by herself to investigate Chinese atrocities in Central Asia and never returned. He writes that his father was madly in love with Barbara and so were many others. Palmer Hoyt, who dated her in Chongqing, once noted that when he referred to Barbara as my girl, his companion responded, from what I hear, she's everybody's girl. She had a reputation as being extremely wild, but not everyone shared that opinion. The author John Hershey stated that despite the all-night drunken parties and bohemian lifestyle, Barbara's relationships with the men in her life were platonic, centered around lively debate and speculations about philosophy. Just why Barbara decided to leave a life she loved in Peking and make the long and difficult trip to Sing Kang remains a mystery. 
in China hands. Peter Ran suggests that she had learned about a nationalist government abuse of the Sinkang tribespeople and decided to find the truth about this as yet untold story. He adds, Perhaps also only Sing Kang could have satisfied Barbara's need to prove her capabilities for travel on a mission rife with peril for even the most intrepid of seasoned journalists. In her own words, Barbara focused more on the practical aspects of the trip rather than her reasons for going. I have made a deal with Time Mag for this trip to make some reports available to them if I run into anything interesting. I'll get a retainer just to keep me thinking about them, with payments in addition for anything they accept or use. I won't bring any luggage except a toothbrush, hairbrush, an extra pair of slacks and shorts, and a shirt, my commando knife, pistol, and camera. I am still a little reluctant to leave Peking. It's a wonderful city, and I don't know how long I'll be gone. I've got a ton of letters of introductions and passes, and credentials from Time Life should help in getting free transportation and other sorts of facilities. I have a letter to the municipal government in each city from the mayor of Peking asking that I be granted whatever assistance possible. I am hopeful of getting into Xinjiang, but I, I can't tell. I haven't tried to obtain permission officially, but there are caravans and truck convoys going there from Lanchao, and I might be able to get next to a Lanchow official and arrange it. I've got a letter from the mayor of Peking to the mayor of Lanchow, which might help. Everyone I know who knows anything about China thinks it is a wonderful trip to take. All the other people, mostly army and marines, think I'm nuts. There's absolutely nothing to worry about. Barbara left Peking for Shanghai at the end of September 1946 to begin her trip to Sinkang province. Her plan was to sail upriver from Shanghai to Hankou, and then on to Chongqing, where the overland part of the journey would begin. It took two weeks for her to secure passage to Hankou. During that time in Shanghai, she was able to make an agreement with the news services to continue sending dispatches from the frontier, which provided her with a little money for the trip. Once in Hankou, she waited four days then secured passage up the Yangtze River to Chongqing on a Chinese merchant marine ship. On the Yangtze River, October 22nd, 1946. I am riding with the Chinese merchant marine on a ship which is anchored at a village a little less than halfway between Yicheng and Chongqing, right in the middle of the Yangtze Gorges. Fine spot, the mountains on either side with the village perched about halfway up. This river is wonderful. This is the second day in the gorges, and I've spent most of the time up in the crow's nest, armed with my two cameras, a ton of film, and a pair of field glasses. Along the sides are fleets of junks slowly edging their way up the gorge, pulled by from 12 to 20 or 30 coolies who hold ropes tied to the junk and pull the damn thing about a mile a day. Frequently, they're ahead of chunk way up on the ledge of a cliff hundreds of feet above the river. We travel with the engines going full speed at about eight or nine knots, but actually move about a half mile an hour. The water looks flat, but the current is terrific, and there are very rough rapids, which sometimes keep us at a standstill. At first, I slept on deck in my sleeping bag, then moved into what was formerly the captain's cabin, a room about five feet square just enough room to climb into my bunk or type with my elbows banging against the wall. There is about ten times as much privacy in Grand Central Station. The food is quite good, and there's tons of it. I'm getting fat without any exercise except a little jump roping and climbing up and down ladders. I've taken lots of notes, and I figure I can write a couple of stories in Chongqing. Barbara arrived back in Chongqing in late October 1946. She stayed for 10 days, writing stories and dispatches, preparing for the trip west, and enjoying the creature comforts of civilization that she would learn to do without in the months to come. November 6, 1946. 
I'm staying in an enormous house belonging to Shell Oil Company on a mountain on the south bank of the Yangtze River opposite Chongqing. It's empty except for servants, and I've been here four days working in a big living room with a fire in the fireplace, eating the food of a fancy cook, an enormous puffy omelet for breakfast with bacon, coffee and cakes at 11, lunch at 1 with soup and steak and fried onions and tiny jam pancakes, tea and cake at 4.30, and a big dinner at 7.30 with something exotic like baked stuffed melon, etc. Finger bowls, silver you can't lift, half a dozen servants to run my hot bath and bring me coffee in bed in the morning and to fetch my cigarette. Last night, I had dinner with the mayor, who has a lot of sense. It surprised me. I pretend to be sure of myself when I beat around talking to mayors and governors and political officials, but when it comes to writing a long story, pretending to tell people what's wrong here and what China and the people are like, I, I sort of get cold feet and think I ought to keep my mouth shut and stop pretending to know so much. I also can't write very well, though no one seems to have caught on yet. I'm leaving for Chengdu day after tomorrow at 5 a.m. I'm more anxious all the time to get up to Xinjiang. When I get back, I think I'll come home in the spring. This wandering gets in your blood, they tell me, and I want to knock off while I can still stop. Sometimes, though, I think I can't stand to leave China. The length and breadth of the trip Barbara had planned was astonishing, especially considering the terrain and the conditions of the roads in 1947. From Chongqing north and then northeast to Shenxi province, skirting the Tibetan border, and then west-northwest to Dihua in Sengkang province, was a journey of 2,400 miles, two-thirds of it across desert and wilderness, as wild and lawless a country as existed in the world. This was along the legendary Silk Road, the ancient trade route to China from Europe, pioneered by Marco Polo 700 years earlier. Chengdu, Sichuan Province, 200 miles northwest of Chongqing, November 9, 1946. Arrived here day before yesterday by truck, 26-hour ride over a beautiful but bumpy road sitting on a bored seat. I'm just beginning to be able to sit down. I'm staying in a Chinese travel hostel. No bathroom facilities, of course. And the John is an alley outside with a couple of stone buckets. I'm trying to get a hold of some letters to the governor of Xinjiang so they will let me through. I can get a snow leopard skin for about $20. I think I'll buy one for a rug. And I hear Ringling Brothers will pay $5,000 for a live snow leopard. So I plan to get one in Xinjiang and bring it home. Santan, Gansu Province, December 19, 1946. It's a cold, wintry evening with snow outside, a temperature much below zero, and the tea remaining in the cup beside me is a chunk of ice. There's a bit of a fire made out of coal dust and mud, but I'm wearing felt boots, three sweaters, and a fur-lined jacket, so you can imagine how warm the fire is. My ink has frozen in the bottle and in my pen, so I've just thawed them out in the fire. I washed some clothes, but they're frozen stiff as boards, and even my toothbrush has icicles on it. My hands are black and scaly from the cold and dirt, and my clothes look like I've been mining coal. It will soon be three months since I've had a bath, and altogether I am not a sight fit for polite society. I am in Santan a little village two days west of Lanchow, where the Chinese Industrial School is located. This city was the capital under Genghis Khan when the Mongols invaded China, and from 100 BC to 1500, it was the site of a great city. Now the whole region is almost entirely deserted. A couple of days ago, I had a fine trip by horse through the mountain passes north of here into Mongolia, I went with one of the young boys in the school here, a Mongolian, and we rode like mad all day, racing each other on two Mongol ponies up and down the mountainsides and across the wide, bare Mongolian steppe. We galloped the final 12 miles without stopping, and I am just recovering today. I am trying to get up the courage to venture out into the cold, 
to go to Tiwar. It is all frozen mountains and desert between here and there with few villages. The trucks frequently break down with their occupants starving to death if they don't freeze first or get eaten by wolves or, or get murdered by the Kazakh raiders. Hami, Xinjiang Province, January 5th, 1947. Arrived here after a pretty tough four-day trip. It was cold as hell, and since it was all Gobi Desert, there was absolutely nothing. No villages, no trees, no water, no nothing. If the truck broke down, God knows what you'd do. The farther northwest you go, the poorer things are. I spent New Year's Eve in an inn in a poor village. It, the room was large, with a kang or mud platform along one whole side outfitted with filthy straw mattresses where myself and five truck drivers, mechanics, etc. slept together. I spent the evening huddled around a brush fire talking to a poor Kansu peasant who told me all his troubles. There are more Mohammedans than anything else in Xinjiang, and they hardly mix well with the Chinese. They look very European, wear different clothes, and aren't like the Chinese at all. Being the first American in Hami in a long time and the first woman, the governor's representative here insisted on giving me a room to stay at the government house. I have a couple of young 18-year-old soldiers who chase around bringing me things and asking questions and generally acting like a couple of little kids. When Barbara arrived in Sing Kang province, she first established a temporary base of operations at the American consulate in Dihua, present-day Arunchi. In mid-January 1947, she left for Ili, 400 miles away in the far northwestern corner of Xinjiang, adjacent to Mongolia, the Soviet Union, and the present-day Republic of Kazakhstan. The character of Alice James in the historical novel Flash House by Amy Liu is based on Barbara's adventures in Ili. It was in Ili that Barbara met the people, witnessed the events, and, most importantly, wrote the stories that would turn her adventure into something of a crusade over the next five months. Stories that were forever lost amid the wreckage of a Chinese Air Force plane crash. Tihua, February 21st, 1947. I just returned from Ili last night after a five-day trip by truck. It was bitter cold. I rode on top of the truck, and as we rode half the time at night, I came pretty near freezing. The last day, we drove 30 hours straight, only stopping to eat, starting at 8 one night and getting here late last night. My eyelashes froze together. My eyebrows froze. And my hair froze to the hood of my jacket so that I couldn't take it off. I got my hands frostbitten while we stopped on the desert in the middle of the night to repair a tire, but a little snow fixed them up. I had a wonderful trip. Spent over two weeks there staying with a very fine tailor family. I managed to find out a great deal about the revolution, which was settled a year ago. Very few foreigners have ever been to Ely, and I am the only one who has the dope on conditions there, about which the Chinese printed almost nothing. I don't think it wise to write too much in detail. If I write the story of Xinjiang and Ely, which only I know, and give it to Life magazine, I could make a big hunk of dough, but I'll see if they can print it without changing it. If not, no soap. If I can't make it entirely truthful, helpful to the people here, I won't write it. Tihua, February 25th, 1947. I am moving today from the consul, for many people who I might talk to are afraid to come here, it being an official place with a guard. A mob of well-organized turkey people stormed the government the other day, with 36 demands such as all Chinese troops getting out of here. They have more than three armies or over 100,000 soldiers. The streets were lousy with soldiers, MPs, and cops. And outside the city, there wasn't a soul on the street, while inside the city, they were all standing in the doorways waiting for a riot. They had great barbed wire barricades at the city gate. 
Everyone was scared to death, especially the white Russians, unofficial Chinese, and Turkey people, as it is the people not involved politically who always get it in the neck. I am getting a pretty good inside story, seeing both Russia and China at work firsthand. But after years of oppression, the people are like clams, even with their friends, and it is tough getting any information. The main idea is that some here are determined to separate Xinjiang from China as an Eastern Turkestan Republic. The Chinese are just as determined not to allow it. The chief question is the strength and nature of the alliance between the Turkeys and Russia and whether the whole business is Russian instigated. The Chinese have spent the past 2,000 years muffing their chance at getting the friendship or trust of the Turkey people, so they are looking to Russia as a friend and ally. It's all very complicated, not easy to figure out without prejudice, but by the time I've been to Kashgar, I will have been all over the place and talked to everyone, and I will figure it all out like a geometry problem and come home and write a book about it. Tihua, March 25th, 1947. I'm leaving for Kashgar tomorrow. My plan is to spend a few weeks in Kashgar, perhaps taking a trip to a nearby city and then return. I had dinner with the governor of Xinjiang, who just arrived from Nanking. I am generally regarded as a heroine around here because of my solitary journeying, which helps when I'm trying to get them to do me favors. I also judiciously keep my mouth shut about my opinions. I hope to get back to Tihua sometime in May and go directly to Lanchao by plane and from there directly to Shanghai. I have just heard that the communists have left Yan'an under heavy bombing by American planes, they say. The more I hear about what America is doing, the more I am disturbed. The 900-mile journey from Tihua southwest to Kashgar, one of the most ancient cities in the world, was, if anything, even more difficult and challenging than the 2,000 miles she had already come. Why Barbara went to Kashgar is not clear from her surviving letters, but it may be she had heard stories in Ili and Diwa about Chinese and Russian influence in the area turning into occupation, if not oppression of the indigenous people there, in one of the most remote locations anywhere on Earth. Kashgar, April 29th. 1947. Kashgar is a lovely oasis. I'm staying at the British consulate, which is quite a fancy estate, and the consul and his wife are very pleasant. I have become absorbed in books about Xinjiang, a complicated and ancient history of Central Asia at the time of the Huns, and after a few days, even Marco Polo seems too modern to read. I expect to leave for Yarkhan, southeast of here, next week, by horse, with a soldier to accompany me. I will spend a week there with my friends, General and Mrs. Tang, with whom I came from Tihua, and also wait for my turkey friend, Hamid. The trip here took 23 days, stopping briefly at the larger cities, where we were entertained in fine style by many banquets in honor of the brave young American lady who had traveled so far and who we must all greatly admire. I was generally regarded as a heroine, mainly because they wanted me to write nice things about them. Though we spent days with nothing but the rudest old bread to eat, we also spent days when we had three banquets in one evening. The four of us spent nearly every hour of almost a month together, sleeping lined up four on a kang or in the desert. But we arrived even better friends. Politically, most of the people, except the richest, are against the Chinese military occupation, but also afraid of the Russians. The Soviets are a bunch of unscrupulous liars, but they've got nothing on the Chinese officials there. I haven't decided yet how I'll get back to Tihua. There are some things I must finish up. Probably I'll go by horse across the desert up to the North Road and catch a truck to Tihua. After returning from Kashgar, Barbara, having been in China for two full years, was ready to return home. While she loved China and the Chinese people, and may have preferred to stay in Peking indefinitely, she believed her story of Sing Kang, Ili, Kashgar, 
and the situation there was of vital importance to America and to the world, that it needed to be told, and that the Chinese national government would never allow it to be told as long as she remained in China. And as she prepared to depart Xinkang province for Shanghai, and then home, Barbara, for the first time, expressed concern for her own safety. Central Asia seems a million miles from nowhere, and transportation is uncertain and liable to collapse. Chinese Air Force planes are very old and quite dangerous to fly in. I may decide to go by truck instead. I don't want to end up on a mountaintop somewhere with a lot of plane wreckage on my head. I've been wandering all around over China's northwest for the past year and have just returned from a four-month trip to South Xinjiang. I feel terribly knowing my absence affects mother so, and I plan to leave here immediately for Shanghai, and from there go home as soon as possible. I'll probably be in New York by September, October at the latest. Just the thought of New York sometimes excites me so that I, I can't bear to think about it. But New York in the autumn is the nicest. Headline edition, August 8th, 1947. The American Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present Headline Edition with Taylor Grant. From all over the world, wherever the day's headlines are made, Headline Edition brings you accurate, timely reports on the news behind those headlines, plus informative in-person interviews with the men and women who made the headlines today. Today's edition presents an exclusive report from Shanghai on the mystery of the missing Chinese Air Force plane and its 26 passengers. Six days ago, a Chinese Air Force transport with 26 persons aboard was reported missing after taking off from Tihua, Xinjiang, for Lan Chao, capital of Kansu province. Among the passengers aboard was a well-known American newspaper woman, Miss Barbara Stevens of Arlington, Virginia. Little information has been released on this incident since the first word that the huge plane was missing, even though last reports from the plane itself had given no hint of mechanical difficulties. Correspondent Bill Conine now brings new and exclusive information on the mystery in a recorded report from Shanghai. On Sunday, August 3rd, a Chinese Air Force C-47 plane bound for Lanshao Kansu province from Tiwa, outermost town of Xinjiang province, broadcast its last message, then was heard no more. The plane was last guessed as still 450 miles from Lanshao Kansu. This so-called desert of the Gobi is a perilously rugged, mountainous area called a desert only because of its barren, vegetationless, arid complexion, the only place where the plane might have landed. Among the 26 persons aboard, including several foreigners, was Barbara Stevens, freelance reporter and writer, an American from Arlington, Virginia. Barbara, 23 years old, is a medium-sized, lovely, blue-eyed blonde, whom we all knew here in Shanghai as one of the most sparkling popular correspondents in China. Miss Stevens had apparently gone to T.Y. in search of material for a book she was preparing. For T.Y. was recently a focal spot in the Xinjiang incident involving reports of invasion from outer Mongolia. I've talked with Chinese Air Force officials. I've contacted missionaries and a correspondent in T.Y. But the curtain of the unknown or the unwilling silence remains. The latest report from Nanjing was that a search plane left there Wednesday. Nanjing is over 1,000 miles from the area, and little or no communications are available to the plane from that direction. Two planes were said to have left T.Y. Tuesday on the search. My sources in T.Y. and commercial airlines state that rarely are there two or more planes in T.Y. at one time. The only small hint obtainable, which looms large in the face of no official information at all, we secured from Chinese Air Force officials, whom we can't name, but who stated, quote, the plane reported it was flying too low, unquote. This sentence was either left ominously unfinished, or it might mean that hope is held by authorities for a successful forced landing. Should such be the case, it could be months before the plane's passengers find their way back to civilization. This is Bill Conine in Shanghai reporting. Details of the fatal flight were obtained from the Chinese Air Force, the office of the Naval Attaché for Air at the American Embassy, Nanking, and from U.S. Ambassador J. Layton Stewart. It's known the plane was a Douglas C-47, operated by the Chinese Air Force with a crew of four 
and carrying 22 passengers. The flight was scheduled to depart from Diwa in an east-southeasterly direction, with scheduled stops in Hami and in Jiyuguin, then continuing on to Lanchao, a total distance of 1,400 air miles in three legs. The flight left Diwa at 9.15 a.m. on July 30, 1947. It safely reached the airfield at Hami, still in Xinkang province, at 11.30 a.m. the same day. It did not continue on that day, perhaps due to weather. Passengers and crew spent the night in Hami. The next day, at 2.50 p.m., the plane took off from Hami for Lanchao with a scheduled stop in Jiyuguan, Gansu province, just east of the high mountain passes that mark the western end of the Great Wall of China. It was a distance of about 500 miles, or two and a half hours. Given the late hour of departure, it's likely the flight would have stopped for the night in Jiyuguan and taken off for Lanchao the following day. The CAF reported that the weather around Jiyuguan deteriorated swiftly after 4 p.m. The cloud ceiling descended below a thousand feet, visibility was reduced below one mile, and it was raining. They theorized that the unstable air currents created by the abrupt change in weather between the desert and the mountains may have resulted in the pilot losing control of the plane. Radio contact with the CAF radio station at Jiyuguan Airfield was lost at 4.50 p.m. The radio stations failed to re-establish contact, and by 6.40 p.m., the plane was declared missing. It was not until October 9th that the United States military air attaché in Nanking reported that after weeks of air and ground searching, hampered by snow, reduced visibility, and the many dangerous mountain peaks in the area, the plane was reliably reported as having struck a mountain, approximately 35 miles northwest of Jiyuguan in Gansu province. A search and rescue party which included the U.S. Assistant Military Air Attaché, was dispatched to the scene of the disaster. On October 20, Ambassador Stewart reported that the Assistant Military Air Attaché was able to identify Barbara Stevens' body and that he personally carried out the cremation so that her ashes might be brought back to Nanking. He found no indication that the crash might have been due to sabotage. His report convinced Ambassador Stewart that rumors of the crash being caused by sabotage were groundless. His report did not convince Barbara Stevens' mother, nor did it convince many of her friends and colleagues in China. On the day of the crash, July 31st, Barbara's mother received this telegram from a colleague of Barbara's at Time Magazine in New York City. We received a cable from our Shanghai office today asking us advice you. Daughter Barbara is well and happy and hoping to come home in September. But after a few days, bad news began to trickle back to the States. On August 4th, a New York colleague from Life magazine sent this telegram to Mrs. Stevens. Chief of our Shanghai office. Cables this morning that the search for your daughter is still going on, but no further information available. We will keep you informed and meanwhile send you our sincerest sympathy. By August 5th, Mrs. Stevens was frantic. A close friend of Barbara's in New York began calling in requests to influential people in Washington. He sent a cable to the well-known political columnist Joe Alsop. Miss Barbara Stevens is reported missing on a Chinese National Airlines plane en route to Luchao. Would it be too much to ask you to wire General Wiedemeyer to see if he has any information? And the same day sent this telegram to Mrs. Stevens. Suggest you send following cable to General Wiedemeyer, care American Embassy Nanking. On July 31, a news report stated that a Chinese National Army HQ plane was missing en route from Tiwa to Luchao and was assumed down in Sinkang province. Among the 26 passengers was my daughter, Barbara Stevens. Have had no news and am frantic 
and beseech your help in getting immediate positive searching action by American Army planes stationed there and possibly requesting Chinese national government to dispatch search planes. Barbara is known to you personally, having been your guest on several occasions while working for OWI Chung King. Also suggest you get either Eisenhower or Marshall and get them to cable Wiedemeyer in addition to asking action. A week later, Mrs. Stevens sent a cable to Madame Shang Kai-shek herself. Barbara Stevens, my daughter, missing in flight Tihua to Lanchao, July 31st. I have been informed that there is dynamite and even asking questions concerning the disappearance of this Chinese military plane. Can it be that my daughter's life is being jeopardized or even sacrificed by Chinese authorities' refusal to make real effort either to get information or release information? Barbara loved your country, served the war effort there, and remained to write a book on China. I appeal to you as a woman and a mother to take every possible action. On August 28th came this reply by mail. Dear Mrs. Stevens, I am directed by Madame Chiang Kai-shek to send you the enclosed details of the fatal flight of the transport on which your daughter was a passenger. Madame sends you her deepest sympathy. Some who have held this letter in their hands swear they can still feel the ice dripping from it. Mrs. Stevens never got over Barbara's sudden death. She passed away in 1961. Soon Mei Ling, better known as Madame Chiang Kai-shek, remained First Lady of the Republic of China in Nanking and later in Taipei, Taiwan, until 1975. She then moved to America and passed away in 2003 at the age of 105 in New York City the city Barbara Stevens loved so much. Madame Shang is buried in Hartsdale, New York, ten miles from where Barbara Stevens was born. Author Christopher Rand wrote to Barbara's mother. Barbara made a great impression on everyone. Her Chinese was remarkably good, and she was always on good terms with Chinese officials, in spite of her criticisms of them, which they were well aware of. The local non-Chinese Cherkai people in Singkang are Muslims. Their women lead a secluded life. And it was unprecedented to have a young American girl cruising about among them as Barbara did. They admired her courage and her ability to take hardships. And they looked on her as a sort of heroine who would tell the outside world about their troubles. I talked to a couple of girls from Kashgar who were traveling with a troop of dancers. And they cried when they heard about the plane. I believe she had accomplished her objective, which was primarily to prove to herself what she could do, and secondarily to gather material for a book. That was finished before she determined to get moving. And my experience is that there would be no stopping her when she was in a mood like that. Getting around China takes qualities that few people seem to have, but that Barbara had it in high degree. Her mastery of the language was remarkable. She was completely fearless. She was also very quick on her feet, and I believe could talk her way out of anything except a failing airplane. China is a chaotic and wide open place, and personalities sometimes develop quickly here when they have the basic material. You would have been pleased if you could have seen the way Barbara spent these last two years. Frederick Gruen, Time Magazine, China Correspondent. I was one of the last Americans to talk with Barbara before she left for Xinkang. I had arrived in Taiwan on the same Chinese Air Force plane, which later carried her away. On July 24th, a party of us were at lunch with the U.S. Consul General Paxton when Barbara strolled in. She had just returned from a month-long trip into the hot, arid South Xinkang and looked extremely fit, a bright-spirited demeanor, wonderful, healthy, freckled tan, blonde hair bleached by the desert sun and sand, but still golden and unusual in this part of the world. She was dressed in a faded shirt with rolled sleeves and tucked into her well-worn riding breeches. Her boots were scuffed from the travel in the far-off places, and in her belt, very swaggery, was a hunting and eating knife. 
She looked very romantic and adventurous. Over the next four days, I saw Barbara on and off. She had a wealth of observation and experience brimming inside her. She talked with great animation about the Kazuk nomads butchering sheep, of the Chinese soldiers pigeon hunting in the compounds of Turkestan, how insufferable the heat of the wasteland really is, all of which, she said, surely must be put into a book. And in the evenings, anyone strolling the consular grounds could hear her typewriter clacking away. At a party one night at General Jang Ji Jung's home, the general paid great honor to Barbara. He put her on his left arm with Mrs. Consul General Patton on his right. All evening, as he and Barbara conversed in Chinese, he toasted her with brandy, champagne, and wine, and she held her liquor like a true gentlewoman. On the morning I had to leave, I saw Barbara and a young Englishman piling their baggage into a jeep that would take them to the airfield. We shook hands. See you again, Barbara, I said, and don't forget to write that book. Four days later, emerging from the desert at Ah Me, we heard Barbara's plane was feared lost. The Chinese army commander there spoke of Barbara as beautiful and was impressed by her command of the Chinese language and her adventures in Xinkang. Her plane had taken off from Ami, but the weather had gotten worse along the way. About halfway between Su Chao and Lan Chao, the weather was impossible, and the pilot radioed that he was turning around. But soon after, when the ground crew sought to contact the plane, it only met silence. Mrs. Diana Shipton, wife of the British Consul General in Kashgar, southern Xinjiang province. Barbara stayed with us for three weeks in April and May of 1947. She had such amazing courage and initiative. When she came here, we were enormously impressed by her bravery and the way in which she tackled a hard journey, alone and in a primitive country. We admired her vivid personality. It was a great pleasure to have her here in this lonely outpost. The American Consul in Tiwa, J. Hall Paxton. My wife and I saw Barbara during her stay in Xinjiang. She visited us when she was in Tiwa in January, April, and again this last month. She was very enthusiastic about this province and seemed to enjoy her whole time here. We admired her courage in traveling through this difficult country under extremely adverse conditions and also the considerable risk she took working in this lawless frontier. The difficulties she overcame with her personal hardihood and the dangers by her brave nature and disarming friendliness with all those she met. Fear never seemed to occur to her as a possibility and that was her best defense. The Chinese Air Force has abandoned the search for the plane on which she left the province and assumes it to be lost. But in view of her record of escape from perils in the past, we can hope she may have done it once more. It might happen that in a few weeks we will hear that she has walked out over land. Dr. J. Layton Stewart, United States Ambassador to China. It was my sad privilege this morning to conduct the burial services for Barbara in Nanking. Those present with me were members of the embassy and foreign correspondents stationed in China who had the pleasure and honor of her friendship during her years in China. Even though she is no longer with us, for those of us who knew her, her zest for living and her love for China and the Chinese people will keep her alive in our memories. The following words are inscribed in Chinese characters on Barbara's tombstone at the American Cemetery in Nanking, the words of her friends. Here sleeps a journalist, young, brave, and true, a husky-voiced girl who loved conversation. You have gone to the place from whence you came. We shall remain on this mad, bloody, unjust earth, 
But, as well you know, we shall never relax in our struggle against the forces of darkness, never surrender, never compromise. And we shall drink and laugh as before. Go, beloved child, rest in peace. You will live on forever in our hearts.